Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this Spotlight on Blockchain and Financial Markets webinar, organized by Ditto, the marketing, business development and communications company for the financial services sector. My name is Michael Imson, and I'm a senior content editor at Financial Times Live, the FT's conference division. And I'm also a chartered member of the Chartered Institute for Securities and Investment, the CISI, and the deputy chairman of the CISI's FinTech Professional Forum. Joining me here today for this discussion at Ditto's London offices are executives from five companies, each working on a very different type of blockchain-based service. The first four are based in London and the fifth in Ireland. First, we have Andy Coyne, co-founder and CEO of Cobalt, which is a fintech startup that's built a blockchain-based infrastructure, a shared ledger infrastructure, for the post-trade processing of foreign exchange trades. The service will go live in November or December. Then we have Gareth Mee, Managing Director of Invenica, which provides IT consulting and software development to large companies. Invenica has been around for 15 years and has just embarked on blockchain projects for two clients. One is a financial reconciliation platform and the other is a fraud detection and prevention system. Our third panelist is Oliver Chemis, Chief Technology Officer and Director of Consultancy Services at Comet FS, which is a voice communications technology startup. Oliver's company is developing a method of recording voice communications of traders in the financial markets onto an unchangeable, immutable, distrib distributed ledger, all matched to the underlying trades. Our fourth panelist is Richard Crook, Chief Technology Officer of Quorum, which is a blockchain venture studio. And Richard joined Quorum last month. Before that, he was Head of Emerging Technology at Royal Bank of Scotland, where he was also working on the Cordite project. And fifth, by no, means, by no means least, is Patrick Curry, OBE, Director of Sedici, which is based in Ireland, but with offices in London. Sedici has patented a method of identity authentication that allows people to prove who they are without having to disclose their personal data, thus reducing the risk of identity theft or fraud. It doesn't use blockchain, but it could be used to address a number of challenges facing blockchain technology. And Patrick's also the CEO of the British Business Federation Authority, which helps write international standards on federated identity management. And the BBFA currently operates 23 working groups on distributed ledger technology projects. Now, um, I would like to say a few words, or I was planning to say a few words about what blockchain actually is and distributed ledger technology, but I think, um, first of all, I'm in danger of time of solving knots. Uh, secondly, we don't really have enough time. There's so many facets to it. And thirdly, um, I hope people listening will have enough of a basic knowledge of what this all is, um, so I don't really need to explain. Um, having said that, um, I was looking at the other day at a Bank for International Settlements document uh, on uh, the possible issuance of uh, central bank uh, digital currencies, and that gives quite a succinct definition of distributed ledger technology. Um, so it says that it's a technology that allows computers in different locations, distributed locations, to make, validate and record transactions in currencies, equities or other assets on a synchronized shared ledger. And um, it, the, the fact that it's, uh, Mark Carney has mentioned this in a few speeches this year, Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, um, distributed ledger technology means that it is definitely uh, a very important topic. For example, the Bank of England is at the moment um, renewing its real-time gross settlement system. And uh, Mark Carney said in his speech, I think it was in June, that uh, this new system will be built so that it, it allows new forms of security settlement using distributed ledger technology to plug in. So that's how important the, the topic is, the Bank of England and other central banks around the world uh, are taking a big interest in it. Now, the format of this discussion is as follows. First, each of our speakers is going to introduce themselves and their own blockchain story in one or two minutes. Then I'll ask them some key questions. And uh, Listeners, you too can ask questions via the webinar site, so please do send some in and I'll try to uh, get them answered near the end of this webinar. Uh, and there's a section on the site which explains how to send in questions and then we'll wrap up with some concluding remarks. So let's start with Andy Coyne from Cobalt. Andy, can you tell us about your blockchain-based project, the one that you're working on, which is, as I said at the beginning, uh, is to create an immutable shared ledger infrastructure for the post-trade processing of FX trades. That's right. Thanks, Mike. Um, Cobalt is a three-year-old fintech company. Um, I co-founded it with um, a partner who used to be a client of mine. I've spent most of my career in financial services, so decades of working in the markets that we've all, we're all familiar with. Um, 
we set this up, there were two things going on. The primary thing was that the industry was fixated with cost reduction, cost and risk reduction. Um, that was the only conversation that uh, particularly the banks were really interested in having. The second thing that was going on at the time was a lot of noise around blockchain, blockchain concepts, etc. So we started spending time looking into that, looking to see if blockchain was a solution to the problem. And the, the key there is that you've always got to go back to the problem and make sure you're solving it. Um, we thought it was. We thought there were certain elements of it that really worked well, made a lot of sense. Um, but as in all, all use cases, we focused on post-trade foreign exchange and the problem, the expense basically coming from the fact that everyone had their own infrastructure to record their version of a trade and seek to reconcile their version of a trade against all of their counterparties. So we estimate the cost of the industry is about $20 billion just in foreign exchange alone. $20 billion. $20 billion. And that's, that's easily verified. You don't even include the buy side in that particular calculation. And so there's a big number to go after, and the goal really here was to create a shared ledger. So before you get to distributed ledger, which is where the security comes, if you like, on the data set, you have to create a single version of every FX trade that is shared, that both parties to the trade can see the same record, not a different independent record, and that you're effectively creating a shared, let's call it a utility-like infrastructure where everyone operates their trades against their counterparties in one place. Um, so that's the shared ledger. And the system, it's real, it exists, we've created it. Uh, it allowed us to be very creative around workflows and everything else. Um, and the, the, the blockchain piece that we really, and we can probably come on to this later, but mm -hmm. we found there were some particular problems with blockchain in the traditional sense that you have multiple nodes and lots of, all the data stored on multiple nodes and all that goes with it because it added cost uh, and it added a lot of chatter between the nodes. We, we found a way of, of dealing with it to create immutability mm -hmm. around the transaction data that was very fast. Right, okay, Andy, thank you very much. Um, Gareth, me, Inbenica, yeah, what, what are your you. blockchain projects? Hello everyone, I'm Gareth, CEO of Inbenica. Um, as you've already mentioned, Michael, we're a, um, a software development and systems integration business with over 15 years of experience. We're used to helping businesses solve complex problems or to solve their business challenges using the latest technology. As you've already alluded to, we're now involved in some blockchain projects. Our customers are, help, are asking us to help them solve problems using blockchain. Uh, I'll draw, we've got a number of projects that we're currently involved in, but I'll draw on a couple. Um, we're currently involved um, with a large telecoms and media company to do a financial reconcili reconciliation application. Um, which allows them and their OTT, over the top service providers like Sky, Experian, etc., um, to uh, have a um, decentralized ledger that allows them to uh, reconcile their uh, financial transactions. Second project that I'll, I'll draw on is for a commodity trading company. Um, we've been a participant in a project for them to help them develop a trading application again using blockchain. Um, the kind of benefits that brings outside of more efficient and faster transactions is security, particularly relating to security and forward, particularly related to um, uh, commodities and organic commodities. So, and secondly, um, actually uh, issues around fraud and the use of physical um, documents to secure loans against a particular asset. So. Those are some of the projects. Okay, have. thanks, Gareth. Um, Oliver Chemist from Comet FS, tell us about your voice communications project. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so Comet FS, we've also um, been around for around 15 years. Um, traditionally, we're building a middleware API layer that sits between the different communication platforms within uh, financial services, so the, the trading systems, the PBXs, the voice recorders, and, and so forth. Um, and I guess in the advent of uh, MIFID and some of the tighter regulations that are coming through, we found more and more of our client base were looking to us to see how we could tie the voice recorders to the specific call data records. Um, and also, as we were doing that type of project, we found that actually getting access to some of this data in proprietary voice recording formats and so forth was generally quite um, cumbersome. So what we started to look at was, was there another way of doing it using a blockchain technology to allow the different parties to push their data into a common ledger and then using the immutability access or the immutability features of a blockchain to actually ensure that those data wasn't changing. So you're kind of meeting the, 
the MIFID or the compliance uh, regulation, whilst at the same time giving probably better ownership of the actual data back to the banks. So they've got now a uh, common schema to actually access that data. They can move it, they can migrate it to other systems, but also making sure that they're uh, meeting the compliance uh, regulations. Okay, thank you. And Richard Crook of Quorum, tell us about Quorum. So uh, uh, Richard Crook, CDO of Quorum, um, it's a blockchain venture studio um, that we've just uh, come out of uh, Royal Bank of Scotland as a team and, and, and stood up. We've been uh, looking at uh, using Corda, a uh, finance grade ledger, uh, over the last couple of years, and we've been solving some of the, the larger problems that we still see need solving in the in the space. One of these is, is decentralisation, where we're not going to find ourselves or we will have failed if we simply replace one centralised business model with another. Um, so well-being clients understand their decentralized problem inside their industries, it doesn't really matter which industry, and then get to a position where actually we're not just simply removing one monopolistic market utility and replacing it with another. Um, some of the projects we've got coming through, uh, things like ARKIT, they are QIT.io, is around quantum key distribution, where actually um, getting to a position where we trust these new technologies, the blockchain or the web, uh, with the, the new round of uh, insecurity coming with quantum um, is a good example. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned, you, you say you used the term blockchain venture studio. Could you just elaborate on what exactly that is? Are you building apps for not just your own company, but for others? We're expecting to see a, a wave of, of, of new apps coming through, dis decentralized or distributed apps coming through. Um, <laughs> as you're building these apps, um, it's going to take a lot of effort to bring people together. Um, those decentralized apps are not going to be the same ones you saw creating Google and Facebook, um, they're going to be uh, members of, a, of an industry, peers or competitors, coming together to solve a problem in their industry, uh, and they need to do that uh, together uh, without ending up uh, recreating what they've done in the past by creating a central actor. Mm -hmm. And it's that final challenge uh, that we see needs to be uh, needs to be solved um, in the, in the mm -hmm. distributed ledger space. Okay, thank you. And Patrick, could you tell us about Sadici? and also the British Business Federation Authority and their, and their relevance to our discussion today. Sure, very happy. Thank you. Um, so my background is aerospace and defence, uh, very high assurance uh, requirements for sharing sensitive information across borders. Um, and part of that has included uh, banking systems and banking risks and also counter fraud. Um, and uh, one of the poster childs in this has been Joint Strike Fighter, largest defence programme on the planet half a trillion dollars so far, and climbing, and a lot of the challenges around that. And when we did uh, Joint Strike Fighter, we had to do centralization of the data because we didn't have blockchain, we didn't have distributed ledgers as we talk about them today. And that meant centralization in Fort Worth in Texas. And so what we had was updates running uh, twice a day, one at midnight and one at midday. And so everybody would try and hammer uh, to get the latest information just after midnight and just after midday. That was the contractual data, but actually, if you're looking at airworthiness data, you had to go and find where the source was because that was the only illegally admissible data. The cost of this, the friction, and all the other good stuff, phenomenal. I wish we'd had some of this technology that we talk about now, then. So, Sidici, um, I have several companies, to be blunt, um, but the two you've asked me to talk about today. So, Sidici is an Irish company based in Waterford, uh, and its core technology is zero knowledge proof. So zero knowledge proof is where two parties or more can prove that they hold the same data but without exchanging any data. There's a number of ways to do this and if there's anybody on the call that wants to know more, look at ISO 27551. Somebody out there will be scribbling that down. Um, and what's unique about this ZKP at the moment is it's not based on encryption or those mechanisms, it's based on graph theory. Which means that at any moment in time when you're exchanging, when you're trying to match data, actually uh, the total data set, which is already in several orders of abstraction, there's less than 2% of the data that actually would uh, be transmitted, if you if I put it that way, um, in the pipe, uh, in order to establish certainty amongst other parties. So this is very fast, and it has very high assurance. And, and what is relevance to blockchain? So, so the re relevance is, is many-fold. Um, on the one hand, uh, we're looking then at how we can uh, map data between chains and indeed uh, uh, on-chain and off-chain activities. And one of the real hot buttons is GDPR and the requirements to be able to 
uh, avoid um, challenges around right to be forgotten and other rules um, in, <clears throat> in that you do not want to have personal information or PII either on a blockchain if obviously you're going to be forced by a court ruling to, uh, to change that data later. And for those that are going, don't worry, hashes solve all of this, that is not true yet. Those decisions have not been made. And the, the variance between hashes, uh, which are, are causing legal questions on this, I'll come back to legal in a moment. Um, so the primary interest that we get is around KYC activities, particular customer facing. We're working very closely with mobile companies on some of the most advanced technology, including things like dual routes of trust, uh, which starts to get over a lot more problems that we have, both in terms of privacy and indeed forensics, when you're trying to examine what, you know, what to do when things go wrong. Very high, all done with user consent, um, except where the, an authority has the authority to find out an answer for something. Um, so, moving swiftly on, BBFA created our, oh, sorry, I would say one thing. Sadichi is also a World Economic Forum tech pioneer. It's won a ton of awards so far. And in the WEF at the moment, we're focused very much on border control. Right. Okay, and the British Business Federation Authority? Uh, created after the collapse of the National Identity Scheme. Uh, when industry said we need to be able to do federated identity, particularly at high assurance. And since then, we've done a lot of work in the areas of military cyber security, obviously identity management writ large, um, and uh, called out in the public services network for, for government, for the UK. Um, but also we've done a lot on privacy, uh, particularly with the UN Special Rapporteur for uh, Privacy Task Force, and that, which brings us in with companies like Google and so on. Um, but also working with the likes of Interpol. Um, and then more recently, we've been very involved in DLT uh, because we contributed to the Walport report, which was written for David Cameron, called Distributed Ledger Technology Beyond Blockchains, uh, which has been translated into many languages. And then more recently, as a consequence of the House of Lords Science and Technology Committee, uh, Lord Holmes picked up the charge to resurrect what was happening on blockchain in government uh, and beyond. So a report was written, DLT for Public Good, and we wrote the draft for that. And we're supporting the activities beyond that today. We've got 23 working groups running at the moment. Um, that number's going to increase. And we're very weak on the finance side um, for reasons to do with um, use cases and so on. So use cases vary from things like food traceability through law enforcement, maritime, aviation, and beyond. Right, thank you, Patrick. You could have a webinar to yourself. Um, with, with Sorry that. about that. <laughs> Um, well, thanks everyone for your introductory remarks. You're all working on some uh, very interesting projects, but I'd like to now look at the bigger picture. And we'll start with, um, with, with Gareth, Gareth Mee. Um, what wider opportunities do you think blockchain technology offers the financial services sector? Not, not, you've, you've talked about your own, what you're doing yourself, but what, are, what noteworthy projects, services or products yeah, stand I, out for you? I think I want to keep this very simple and actually talk about business benefits, mm -hmm. because that's ultimately what our customers are interested in. Uh, and this might be quite simplistic in itself. Um, Patrick's alluded to KYC already, and that's an important <laughs> element of this. It's crucial. Um, but, you know, some simple points. I mean, faster clearing and settlement of transactions, um, you know, which means a reduction in fees. And we, we've seen that with cryptocurrencies, et cetera. Um, but, you know, there's also a movement with corporate organizations and the banks to, you know, embrace decentralization. I think uh, Richard here has already mentioned R3, uh, which is an interesting initiative, and banks are considering this move, which is fantastic. Um, the second point that I'd like to make is around improved uh, contractual performance, so the whole concept of smart contracts. And I think eventually we'll, we'll move to a world where you know, contracts will be agreed based on predetermined um, terms, mm -hmm. effectively. So we complete a contract based on pre-agreed terms. Um, and that's a massive benefit to any business, um, both from an operational saving perspective and an efficiency perspective, and also uh, an audit perspective, okay? Um, moving on from that, then I alluded to KYC, and actually we've got some experience ourselves with KYC because, interesting enough, we're working on a solution for a mobile provider. Um, and, you know, it, 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 it's immutable and it's traceable, um, and it means not only can uh, companies reduce the operational expense of KYC, making it more efficient um, and reducing fraud, 
identity theft, et cetera. Um, but it, it, it also means that potentially, particularly for our customer, they have a way of monetizing their KYC capability. So I think those are the three areas that I wanted to highlight. Okay, thank you. And uh, Oliver, um, what, what do you see as the, the broader benefits that blockchain technology can bring to the financial services firms? Um, I think some of the ones that we've been looking at more more than others are around the identity sort of aspect of um, uh, blockchain technology and how people can own sort of several uh, different identities across different systems and how they can be tied together. Um, the, sort of, the concept of, sort of sovereign identity, both for the user's point of view, but also as uh, people work within the banks, how they have their identity within the different communities to which they interoperate and the ability to tie those together. And certainly from our perspective, it it works quite nicely because then we can allocate the different communications to the different communities that they're sort of members of. Um, so that's certainly one that we're sort of spending a lot of time looking at and uh, we look at Sadiqis and uh, and others uh, as, as we move forward. But that's uh, that's one. Um, and on the other side is, I think as has been mentioned, the, the concepts of trade reconciliation. So obviously that's, again, quite critical for us if people are starting to uh, reconcile trades on the blockchain is how we can then ultimately tie from our perspective communication back to those reconciliations. Mm. So they're, they're the two sort of key sort of areas outside of what we're doing that yeah. we're sort of looking with, at. With your voice communications, would it would it would it, would those voice communications ever be transcribed? Yes, yeah, so certainly the way yeah, yeah text. Yes. Yeah, so the way we're the, we're building our platform. So as we as you mentioned, I think it's it's more of an alliance. It's not something that we're necessarily sort of building all ourselves. We're working with various different solution mm. providers across the industry, um, both voice recorders um, data captures, data analytical parties. And, and the, the key remit was um, the ability to sort of configure the systems uh, from a, a uh, you know, from a compliance angle, so who's capturing which elements of the data. And then also once you've captured that data, having a common schema so different parties can push the information into it. But ultimately the the, the end goal is that the, um, we're trying to sort of almost say that compliance is a cost of business and the actual end goal is that once you're MIFID compliant or you're, you've got this, this set of data that can now can be analyzed and certainly an angle of that is how do we get that data pass it to transcription engines so they can then transcribe right. that data and push that information back onto the ledger right. as well. But it would only be transcribed if the regulator or somebody in the bank wanted to. It's, so from our perspective it's yeah so it's very much it's about how, how the solution is configured so some banks may decide they want to transcribe every call that goes through their, their enterprise in which case every time the voice recording systems say well I've got an update and they, they update the ledger to say there's a there's a new transcription here. Then the transcription engine will be able to see that there's been an update, request that data. So we're not actually necessarily pushing the voice recordings and the data onto the ledger itself. We're pushing hashes on, or yes. actually Sadiqi can suggest something better to push on. <laughs> but but we're pushing hashes of the data on that notifies the other members of this uh, distributed network that there is some data that can be used. So whether that's to analyze it in a uh, in a sort of a data lake, or whether it's to request the voice recording in order to then transcribe it and update the system as well. Yep. So it's very much allowing the different service providers almost to integrate through a common schema and notify one another using uh, this. Uh, mm -hmm. Currently we're using a, a quorum, which is a sort of, again, it's a, a Ethereum Enterprise Alliance based uh, mm -hmm. product backed by JP Morgan, but um, whether we use that or Corda or Hyperledger, or pretty transparent from that yeah. perspective. Okay, um, Andy, um, broader benefits of blockchain? Yeah, yeah. so um, what's really interesting in this in this discussion is that you know key words have been thrown around and they, they tend to be trust, immutability, identity, these things. Um, and also what I like to hear is that people are actually working on very real use cases, whereas a few years ago when we started, certainly started looking at things, um, there was lots of proof of concepts, there was lots of, you know, even, even R3 came about to sort of gather everyone around and start debating the whole topic and look at specific, try and look at specific use cases. And of course, there are probably hundreds of use cases for this, for this technology, which is why there's a lot of noise around it. You know, in, in the financial services industry specifically, there are a huge amount of problems to solve. And all of them mentioned here, trust, immutability, golden copy, transactional data, no more reconciliations, post traders mentioned. You know, we, we decided to focus on post trade specifically in one market, um, but there were a lot of use cases at R3 or companies like Exony or yeah. Digital Asset Holdings, they're all working on different use cases. You, you've used the term golden copy uh, two or three times. Yeah. Um, what do you mean by that? I mean, the single immutable copy, is that, is that all? Yeah, it, it means you're, 
you're at the point where you first of all you don't need to reconcile it, and as long as you always go back to the people have this habit of trying to take another copy of the of the original copy, which is where the industry got into all its original problems. And what we're trying to do is put that genie back in the bottle and say, you know, I'll give you an example. Whenever someone trades foreign exchange on an as execution venue, there are four copies of the same trade instantaneously. We take all four and put them back together and say, did you all agree with each other? Did you book it correctly? Uh, you know, effectively with a notary to the transaction, say, yes, you did create the golden copy. Now, we don't mind if that's shared on a single ledger, multiple copies distributed ledger, because the industry, because that element is collaborative and that needs to be decided by the industry as to where the data is stored. We recognize that whilst we create the golden copy, there are, there are people still, we want people to look at the golden copy and all of the related post-trade services that run from that. Um, but we know they might take, they might want to see it behind their firewall. So you have to have the, the technological capability while we're prepared to work or be ledger agnostic in our sense because we found the industry hadn't really collaborated or agreed on a distributed ledger construct, mm. which is why we focused on immutability first. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, Patrick, um, broader benefits of DLT, blockchain, and financial services. Um, so, I mean, we're starting to get some themes here. Um, the key things are we're talking about collaboration because the hints in the word distribution and distributed. So if you're not distributed, then you're actually in a pretty niche area. And this is about quality data. So one issue, for example, is if party A writes something to the blockchain, but actually makes a mistake and then goes back to correct it, and somebody else has done something in, in the intermediate period, the question then comes, how do you resolve that? So there's quite a bit of effort in our world, in smart contracts at the moment, to look at how we can do remediation, predefined remediation on the chain. Because the last thing anybody wants to do is to have a dispute which drives an off-chain, excuse me, an off-chain interaction, which could effectively slow all the <coughs> wrong pipe. Sorry, Patrick Curry. <coughs> Taking a glass of water. Yeah, yeah. Shall we? Um... So, um, what I wanted to perhaps bring out also is that the big advantage is we're reducing dispute resolution. So, an awful lot of transaction time is taken up or business time is taken up uh, with dispute resolution, and that's going away. Mm -hmm. <coughs> However, we need to be very careful from a legal point of view. Um, immutability is not a legally accepted term. This is about risk at the end of the day. And we are reducing risk in an awful lot of areas, but we need to be careful because there are other tools in the toolbox that we need. Yep. But we need to fix the identity problem. Uh, I absolutely completely agree. Um, but we're seeing benefits appearing in all sorts of areas. And one of those is that people who don't get visibility of data today, or oh, sorry, yesterday, are beginning to get visibility of data which they otherwise would not have seen. So there's a wider, um, second order benefit uh, that's starting to occur in many, and there are many, many examples. Of that. Okay, thank you, um, Richard. <coughs> benefits. So for benefits and, and the opportunities of this, um, if we're focusing on the, the technology, um, you saw back in 2015, 42 banks come together. There's only so much fun you can have with a blockchain on your own. <laughs> um, and and <coughs> plus the, the banks came together because. And which, which project was that? What was the name? First, the, the distributed ledger group uh, that came together, uh, and that went out to go and build a finance grade ledger. Um, the reason for that was because over the last 25 years, we've been getting to single sources of truth in true house, um, and we talk about a golden source just there. But what you're really talking about here is we have a single source. We don't disagree because we only have one spreadsheet between us. You think of the number of business processes that people on this call have where they're sending emails with spreadsheets back and forth, they're running each other up. It doesn't matter if you're in Andy's space trying to do FX netting where you're just trying to work out, did we do these trades? Did, did you? Did, and it gets to a position where actually the old saying of a person with two clocks doesn't know the time. You're trying to get to one clock. So you look at the uh, mortgages project that we uh, have to stay with, where we showed the regulator that they are a person with two clocks. They get those trades from the different houses every day, and they have to add them up. And guess what? They don't know. Mortgages is a great place. Eh, 1,500 mortgage uh, lenders drop their mortgage books out to the FCA every 90 days. And there's either too much land or too many mortgages. It's, 
not a difficult problem, but for some reason uh, it is. Now, actually, um, it doesn't matter if you bring the five Irish banks together um, out in Dublin, which is what we did to build them a distributed clearinghouse. Payments is about agreeing that the two bank core systems equal the same amount. We haven't created any money or lost any money. Actually, for those on the call who've ever run a business and you've got a general ledger inside your company and accounting software, when you send invoices out and you receive them back, what are you doing? You're simply going through a reconciliation. It might be archaic, it might be Victorian, but you are simply trying to get to these things. The Joint Strike for a fighter analogy or, or, or project that Patrick was giving us is exactly that. You know, how, much of I, how much of this is my own, how much do you do? All we're trying to get to is a central database. You created that back in Texas, but actually you then suddenly realize you don't want a central actor because a central actor at that point has pricing power and they'll exploit it. We call them members of the stock exchange, but the reason they're members is only because historically they came together as a group trying to solve an industry problem. They are no longer members. They are at the mercy of that stock exchange who now has a monopolistic position. You can see where the themes are, are running with this. I think actually, if you look in the 90s with email, which allowed inter office or intercompany communication, allowed employees of two companies to talk, you're now in a position where you have a technology that will allow you to interrelate with business process. So the last 25 years of the investment banks has been getting rid of cost inside the bank. The next 25 years is getting rid of cost inter bank. Now, um, you, you started off by talking about these 15 banks getting together in 2015, one of which would have been Royal Bank of Scotland, where you worked. Why did you give up the opportunity to carry on working with RBS a month ago and join Quorum. Couldn't you have achieved more? Why couldn't you have achieved more within a massive bank? We saw value. We saw value of, of the nine founding members uh, that turned into 42. We never expected it to be that many. Um, that was about focusing on the enterprise uh, use of blockchain technology, the underlying um, technology that sits underneath Bitcoin. Well, the majority of people have now understood how they can use blockchain or distributed ledger and are doing it. Sitting around the table are a number of companies that are making damn good ground on that. We have avoided uh, inside those financial institutions, Bitcoin, Ripple, uh, and the, the cryptocurrencies, which last year raised up to uh, 700 billion in, uh, in market cap. Every time you make a payment, a store of value moves from one person to the other. They don't do that normally for no purpose. They do it because there is a counter leg of goods and services coming out the other way. Everything that is a payment one way is a two-legged atomic swap of goods and services coming the other way. Currently, right now, those two are totally discrete. You make payments usually as a commercial through a nasty bank portal, um, and you make the goods and services through the other side. What we have in the crypto space, and what they've been working on over the last four years, are stores of value. And they've evolved and got themselves into a position where people trust that. First time, we have a store of value, a digital asset, which people can't replicate, can't copy, and that has now proved its worth at market conditions. On the enterprise side, we've now been building apps in the enterprise space without any of that store of value or any of that cryptocurrency, just proving that we can get a single source of truth. Mm -hmm. Once you get to a common fabric that allows you to actually move stores of value in one way, and goods and services in the other, Patrick's example of the Joint Strike Force, where you're buying that data, and you're returning it with the earnings on the same ledger, you can do that. And the reason I left is because actually the incumbents are uh, moving uh, and RBS has been a, a tremendous sponsor and uh, employer, but they are moving at a glacial speed. What you are starting to see is the merger between the crypto space and the enterprise space. And you've seen the emergence of enterprise tokens as we see those stores of value now come into these ledgers and start to hydrate those types of systems that Patrick talks about or Andy talks about. Right. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Well, we've heard lots of positive comments about uh, what blockchain has to offer. Um, let's look at some of the negatives because there are quite a few, I'm sure. Um, when I say negatives, I mean obstacles in the way of um, DLT. And Richard, you just said banks, the big banks, tend to be moving at a, a glacial speed compared with uh, fintech startups. So I'd like to ask Andy, start with Andy. Um, what would you say are the, the, the main barriers? 
to um, the further development of blockchain, whether they be technical, operational, cultural, cost, or regulatory? Um, the barrier used to be understanding, um, but I think we'll long over that particular barrier. I think there's a very, uh, there's a much wider understanding of how this technology can work and different, uh, different ways of, of making it work. But the, the barriers in financial services in particular is what we found as a fintech is that you know you still have vendor risk management, procurement services, infra, infra security. Um, we found in particular there was a lot of nervousness around the full database being on multiple nodes. And we, we work with a, a, a company called Settle, uh, who are a ledger provider, and that worked. You know, mm. But the reality was the banks didn't agree on that particular provider. So you have this problem where you require collaboration, yet they're not quite there. So you have to stage the rollout of the technology. You have to get to the shared ledger. You have to create immutability. When the distributed network that all the banks do agree upon is available, quite happy to put the data on there as well. So, so there are stages. Um, the most that, if I may, that's collaboration based amongst the banks that want to use the network, yeah. but it's also collaboration between network providers. Yeah. So the US government and others are putting money into interoperability between chains. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's going to be very interesting to see how this develops, but that requires obviously some further collaboration about the policies, the interoperability, and indeed things like identity and assurance. Yeah, I think that everything you mentioned there takes time, and all, all most of the business around here don't have the luxury of time. You've got to make a business, so you've got to, you've got to work out where to, where to add the value in the quickest time horizon to make sure that we start to address that $20 billion or whatever it is of cost that needs. I think I agree with Patrick and Andy. It's, like it's, it's about collaborative mindsets. And, you know, whilst the technology is there and the solutions are there, in fact, you know, it's, it, it's relatively easy to build a solution. It's not as complex, it's hard, but we've all done that and we've solved that problem. But some of the um, problems we've experienced with our projects is a business mindset. You know, it's a, it's a trust. So whilst the technology provides trust, there's still a, a mindset within the business that they're not sure they trust the solution or each other, mm. you know, and, and, and that's an education process. Yeah, you know, the business takes some time, and Andy's right, it takes some time. The business being the board of directors and yeah, the, yeah, well, the, the business partners, yeah, mm. within the, uh, yeah. and, you know, that's, that's an educational thing. There's yeah. been a big rise in requirements for board level education. Right, so that point. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the, best, the best example of that is um, back out in Ireland. Back end of uh, December uh, 2015, uh, we brought the five Irish banks together, built them a decentralised ledger, distributed the data between them. But in actual fact, to get it to go live, they wanted to stand up a centralised legal entity. And at that point, you might as well have put a database in the middle, given them an API, and, right. and off they go. And it's that understanding that this is not a technical problem. The technology you know, is immature, but is, is, is moving in the right direction. It is a business understanding that you are, if you are simply distributing the data but remaining with a centralized business model, you are using the wrong technology. Right, so, so Richard, there's a business barrier. What, what other barriers? Regulatory barriers? What is, what's it like dealing with the regulators? Are they open to all of this? So the regulator um, historically has, has only had two uh, tools in their toolbox. They can either ask for more data uh, or they can ask for data in a different way. Um, actually, what we've um, experienced and, and shown to a number of regulators, the SCA being one of the, the most foremost in that, is they have now a new uh, tool in their toolbox, state. They can hold states between two regulated entities and force them to come to consensus agreement, a single source. Trade reporting is by far the hardest regulatory report that they've created, which is give us all your data, more of it, and give us it in a different format. Actually, You've now got a technology which the regulator can push back upon those regulated entities and say, come to agreement on the trades you've made and then give us a single copy of that. And I think it's what's really interesting on the back of that, the, the senior level within the banks, um, separately, they are coming to their own conclusions as to what their main strategic vectors are. And those vectors are beginning to align, even though the banks themselves are not talking to each other that much. But trade finance absolutely is a good point. Mm -hmm. And all of that, um, barriers, obstacles? Um, I think some of the ones we came across, we started quite a few years ago when Ethereum was first coming out, we first started looking at it. And at, mm -hmm. at the time, I think the barriers tended to be this sort of, it's a bit like the Wild West in terms of the tools changing, the sort of the actual specs changing as, as we went along. So I think that that's sort of calmed down a lot. But what we found now is 
from our perspective, is looking at which ledgers and which types of uh, blockchain the banks are going for. Obviously, R3 has been mentioned, then you've got um, Quorum, uh, you've got Guard Time. So there's a number of different um, initiatives going on. So where we've tried to focus is much more around creating the common schema, the ability to create the hashes and kind of letting the banks decide between themselves. We kind of took a slight step back there and let the banks decide which blockchain technology they want to use and then we'll sort of work uh, with the one that they select really. So I think it's, it's that, we've sort of had this decision process now, we've kind of proved out where we want to get to. We've been building applications that sort of are leveraging the, 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 uh, the principles of the, the blockchain and now it's really about getting the banks to decide, yes, we're happy with whichever one they choose, whether it's quarter, and uh, and allow us to then start to actually push the data into it mm -hmm. uh, in that way. Okay. Well, look, we've got a, um, a question in from uh, Gregory McCreary. It's about commodity trading houses. Um, I'll tell you, I'll read out the question and then see if anybody is able to answer it. Um, with respect to the commodity trading houses, has there been interest for adoption of shared ledger technology in this market sector? So commodity trading, trading has anybody... Yeah, yeah, because one Gareth? of the projects that we worked on is a commodity trading platform, so, oh. as I alluded to in the, in the first instance. Um, you know, and you know, some of the problems and primary problems that we, we, we're trying to solve there, and <laughs> linked it to some clever IoT, but is um, actually pr is, is stopping fraud uh, relating to the use of misinformation uh, around particularly organic materials, right? The degrade, <laughs> right? And also um, related to the use of warehouse notes to secure loans, physical warehouse notes to secure loans, for example. So, yes, there's definitely applications. And so our legal working group, which has yes. uh, many <laughs> nations involved in it, but they've picked on coffee. Yeah, coffee and, perfect, and right? they really <laughs> want to be able to get the traceability and the supply chain really tightened up. Yeah. And what I think would be you know, my prediction would be is we're going to see the trading piece fit with the supply chain piece in a way that hasn't happened yet. Yeah, no, I agree. And, you know, that's what our client is trying to solve. <laughs> no, seriously. Okay. It's, a, it's a massive application. Um, a subsidiary question to that question was how, how, would it, how would it work? You might have already alluded to it, but would, it be, would the prime mover have to be one firm to build an open source platform, or do you really have to get everyone together? To build this, yeah, what, what, what do we mean by a, yeah. you know, does it have to be one legal entity? Could it be a JV? Could it be a multi party agreement? There's all sorts of collaborative models with, um, as there was with, with the banks that, uh, yeah, sure. so look at, look at the, um, the project, uh, the FCA sandbox has in it a, a project looking at uh, digitizing mutual society. You go back and look at a mutual society, you'll, you'll, you'll look at it and think, hang on, we've been here before, <laughs> we've got a number of. Uh, mutually distrusting parties who want to come together, pull their resources, and act uh, on a common goal. Build a ship, build a rail, it doesn't matter, build a building society. And uh, what that uh, project did inside the FCA sandbox was uh, take the construct of a mutual society and bring it onto a blockchain, onto a distributed ledger, so you have a legal anchor, thus you don't need that central legal entity, you, you've actually got members coming together. So obviously, um, you're trying to get everyone to line up in a row, you're never going to make it. Uh, and he alluded to that when there's got to be phasing to this. But once you start to create a momentum, uh, it happens. People have to go back to the 90s where if they remember, they couldn't send text messages off their network. They could only send text messages to their friends who were on the same network. And then out of nowhere, they started to connect and it started to... It isn't about waiting around for some magic bullet to work. It's a matter of actually recognizing that we will be in these little silos for a bit, but over time, the consumer will push hard to get that into operability. Yeah, there's, there's one thing to mention on that. So, so you touched upon Quorum, and we looked at Quorum, made sense, uh, but other banks, because it's JP Morgan sponsored, other banks didn't have an interest. So they're still competitors. The question is, how do you bring the competitors around the table to collaborate on one thing? And for us, the goal was, you don't compete on what we do. It's just the cost. So that's an easy decision. You don't want to. You don't want to be. You don't make money from a back office or a middle office. You only spend money on it, and you all do it differently. Why don't you do it in one way, in one common place? Solve the problem. You know, you're all doing the same thing. You can do it in the same way. So, so that's where you can get real use cases going, where people have a common problem. Um, they just got to rethink the commodities thing as well. Same thing. You could do what we do. In effect, you can do commodities. It's a contract. It's a shared contract. I mean, it's very simple. So 
but you need something to kick it off. Now, it could be one of the participants, but no one else would probably join that. Yeah. So it, could, it might have to be an independent, it might be a startup. And this is, this is what startups feed off, is the opportunity to create a collaborative idea within a marketplace or whatever. Okay, thanks, Andy. Uh, another question from Andrew Clark. How comfortable would regulators be with the use of single identity on a blockchain, given the dubious history of reliance and current jurisdictional restrictions on origin of data to be relied on? We're not doing that, to be blunt. We're not using single identities on there. So at the moment, we, we're moving to pseudonyms um, because we require this for privacy reasons. And one-time pseudonyms is the direction of travel um, pretty much by consensus at the moment. It may not be in the banking fraternity, but it absolutely is from a uh, technological space. So I completely agree with what's implied behind the question, um, but the, uh, the, the, the whole identity area is much more sophisticated than people um, may appreciate. Uh, our country, I'm afraid, is not near the front of the bus when it comes to identity, as Richard eloquently described in the Palace of Westminster recently. So let's, I've been on record once before, I'll do it again. <laughs> KYC is not a good use case for blockchain. I know there's been a lot of money spent on it in the early years, uh, attempting to try and use blockchain for KYC. It is a marriage of convenience. Um, actually, it's a large challenge in the financial industry. We know that KYC is a problem. KYC is a problem because you are trying to identify yourself over digital channels. It doesn't matter if it's the web, it doesn't matter if it's the blockchain. So the web and uh, the blockchain technologies need identity, but they are not technologies for solving it. And uh, we've seen a number of projects where we're simply photocopying passports and moving them around on the blockchain and hoping that that, by creating consensus, would be a good idea. It's not. It, it's, there's a reason that you do not see KYC utilities in the financial services industry, because if I rely on the KYC and it is proved that that KYC is not correct, I get fined, not the person who supplied the KYC. So if you have HSBC and Barclays and for some reason Barclays decides to rely on HSBC's KYC over the blockchain and then Barclays is found to be laundering Russian money, actually they get fined. They can't push it back to the, the upstream bank. So that's where what you need to actually recognize is Identity is a higher order problem. It is solved mostly unless you move to sovereign identity at a national level. And I walk into Heathrow, I put my passport on the gates. When I put my passport on the gates, they open. The passport has been validated against my biometrics and it has been validated against the passport office. It is a valid passport to let me in the country. Currently, the banks do not have access to those APIs to validate whether the passport you're using to open a bank account is a valid passport. All it does is prove that the photo in the passport is the person standing in front of you. So in actual fact, what we really want is a bit more open government with a bit more APIs to give us an identity so, infrastructure. So come and join one of the working groups where we have all the... But that's in the UK, and they No, no, no. It's talking, it, it, this is a, a, a global issue right, um, okay. which is being addressed. So in both the Walport report and the Holmes report, mm -hmm. we made it really clear we have 70 million passports live, never mind all the fake ones out there, and what we're not doing is validating passport data. We rely on a passport document, which is very, very easily to, easy to spoof. Why? Because they're not checked using the kinds of systems that the passport was designed for, and that's just a fact of life. As soon as, soon as your passport has... Um not because we contracted well, the manufacturer. But things like revocation, from. things like reporting lost and stolen, these things don't flow through. The bank never gets told. This is what one of the things that we're discussing today is real-time notification to relying parties. What the, banks would like, what the banks would like is one of those gates you see in Heathrow in one of their branches. Yes. Yeah. But, but without lots of technology spent. Yes, but I agree. Um, Richard, KYC registry, SWIFT. Right. Don't SWIFT have something called a KYC registry? Flip it around the other way. 98% like of adults have a bank account in the UK, and they will, of course, be doing KYC, and the banks have done that to a higher level. So actually, from a government perspective, they flip the coin, the other, they flip the table around the other side and say, hang on, you know who 98% of the adult population is. Why don't you provide an identity? There is absolutely no reason why the banks can't step in and start to issue certificates. They do that already. You have a letter of introduction, take you back to the old days. If you were moving into a country, you'd ask for a letter of introduction. And who would provide that? Your bank. And the same is true now, where actually, if you look on the web, you'll start to see merchants are starting to actually put their name at the top of the browser. The little uh, padlock blocks up to say you want a secure line. 
but also it now says who the legal entity is on the other side. Those legal entities can be reported back since the crash to um, the GDFIO registry. There is a registry yeah, yeah. of all legal entities. We're in a really good place right now to start. It's getting better, but I'm going to be a bit provocative. So on the Avalanche network takedown, that was a criminal network. There were 800,000 fake domains with 800,000 fake companies behind them. And um, and that's just one network. And, and what, what was the avalanche hack? name of the, of the criminal network? Right. Yeah. And what, right. Okay. When was that? Uh, roughly just under two years ago. Right. And then we took down. Sorry, Interpol and Europol took down two dark markets on either side. One in China, one in the Netherlands, which again had massive penetration. Um, and and th this is the side that you know public don't see. So actually, part of our work, we're trying to do much more to bring law enforcement into the processes. Because if we can't prosecute, we being society, we can't deter. So back to the back to the conversation here. Hmm. You know, photocopying passports, putting them on a blockchain, moving them around time. is a waste of time. Getting ourselves away from a paper-based passport into a digital token that we can use to identify ourselves, either as consumers or as entity, legal entities. Based on authoritative data. So the key thing here is the distinction between authoritative and corroborative data. And authoritative data is what's legally acceptable in a court. Corroborative isn't. So there's a real push in companies like Bloomberg, Thomson Reuters, and others to get to authoritative data because we're swelling around in an awful lot of corroborative data that never gets you to the level of quality data that you need to get to for what we're talking about. Right. Um, I hope everybody <laughs> follows follow, follow all that. Um, if I may, can I, can I, because there's a couple of other things I think we need to get on the table. Okay, we, we've almost run out of time, oh, but, just, but, okay. but, but um, when you're enjoying yourself, time does go very quickly. <laughs> but these couple of things, can you tell us in 10 seconds? In a nutshell, yes. Be, um, the most advanced legislation that, that our lawyers consider today is what's happening in Malta. They've now passed three acts of parliament. There's a fourth one that is being discussed where a, a DAO, a distributed autonomous organisation, is due to be given legal personality for the first time. That has had significant implications for how companies are run, which gets back to some of what you're talking about earlier on. So I'm pointing at Richard. No, that's, that's <laughs> fine. And if you look at the FCA sandbox, we've done that here in the UK. We, we don't have a legal piece behind it yet. But anyway, I mean, that space. this is Walter, which yeah. wants to be the block. The other thing that I would wish to highlight is that in the International Standards Organization, we've just done a security evaluation of consensus mechanisms. Remember that the original block Bitcoin was designed to avoid centralization, avoid authority, avoid tax and many other things. And what we're seeking to do now is have technologies which are regulatory compliant. So certainly with the partners in Switzerland, we are, we are seeing new kinds of coins, new kinds of wallets, new kind of exchanges starting to emerge, which have trust much more embedded um, at scale. And I think this is what we need to, to be thinking of in the future. And that gets us to something called proof of authority rather than proof of work. Right. So blockchain started off as a bit, bit wild westy, um, and it's, because it's coming under the, um, the regulatory umbrella now um, with, with all these things happening. Well, look, um, we're just about finished, um, we're out of time, but I'd like everyone to sum up uh, their final thoughts in about half a minute or so. Um, and uh, we'll start with Andy from Cobalt, and it's pretty simple, really. If there's one thing you've said during this webinar that you'd like people to remember, what is it? Uh, I think the key is focus on the problem you're solving. Uh, don't get distracted. There's a lot of interesting topics today, but don't get distracted from what you're good at, what you can achieve. Um, I, th I think this technology is is game changing. Uh, I think it's going to move away from it where it was initiated, which was Bitcoin was mentioned. But I think it's going to move far away from that. Like all these things, they move on, and people use it in different ways, and use it in realistic scenarios. Deliver some value. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, Gareth from Invenica, what's your pearl of wisdom? Uh, <laughs> my pearl of wisdom, I, I think Andy's kind of coined it, but um, blockchain, you know, it's growing, growing massively in prominence. It's great that enterprises are adopting it and applying it. Um, I think that, um, and it could, it is a game changer. Uh, it can be a game changer, particularly in the finance and trading sectors. Um, I think there's huge amounts of value um, to be gained from blockchain. Um, but there are some misconceptions, uh, there's some distrust from the bus from businesses um, and I, I think you know businesses need to decide whether they want to embrace it or not embrace it. Um, but there's a huge amount, uh, there's some 
there's a huge amount of cross industry experience and learning. I think that's represented in this room today. Um, and I'm hoping organisations like ourselves and the organisations around the table can help um, educate business and actually let them let them understand where they can apply the technology to solve real okay. business problems. Okay, thank you. And uh, Oliver from Comet FS. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty pretty well covered. <laughs> um, so I guess from what I've said, it's really that um, on a Comet FS note, I guess that we've released our schema and we are looking to now start to get people to actually start to use it. So uh, if you're interested, get in touch, I guess, would be uh, from my side. Um, Richard from Quorum, um, what would you like people to remember about what you've said? I think we've, we've focused on the challenges of decentralization. I think people have taken that away. But I think the, the opportunity here um, is that over the last 10 years, we've been running through a fintech revolution, and that has ended up issuing brightly colored debit cards, which is effectively lipstick on a pig. <laughs> to the banking system. If you take one thing away, go and have a look at gdf.io, it's a website. Yep. Go and have a look at that. Understand that we are right now watching a disruption to the issuance of capital, which is at the pointy end of the financial services industry. If you disrupt capital issuance, it has a knock-on effect all the way down through the investment banks, onwards into the commercial, into the corporates, into retail, and onto the consumer. That, if there is one thing to go and look at, is gdf.io. Right, okay, thank you. And Patrick from Sodici and the uh, BBFA. Collaborate to compete, don't compete to collaborate. We have to work together on this. And, I, and there's going to be a lot of really good innovation, and the one I'd like to highlight is fractional ownership. There are six companies at the moment going through in the property space on fractional ownership which is going to have a massive impact in the mortgage markets as we understand them today. But it's also going to help to defeat money laundering in the property space in a very major way. So I'm looking forward to seeing a lot more innovation, of really new ideas, and it's going to have strategic significance. Okay, thank you. Um, well, this has been a live broadcast, but it's been recorded as well, so it's going to be uploaded to the it's a website. It will be available shortly for you to view again, to, for you to listen to again, if you wish, or to share with your colleagues. Our next spotlight will be on digital transformation. That's on November the 14th. And uh, on the panel will be regulated firms and IT suppliers to those firms. And they'll be talking about cu customer trends and incorporating those customer trends into business to business practices. Um, if you haven't already received notification about this spotlight, you'll receive one soon. Um, just uh, click on to the Ditto website, click on news, and you'll find the details. So that's it. All that remains for me to do is to thank our listeners for listening and to thank our five panelists for taking part. Thank you, Andy Coyne, Gareth Mee, Oliver Chemist, Richard Crook, and Patrick Curry. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.